You are listening to Insights from the Conference Board. I'm Sarah Murray, Managing Director International of the Conference Board and host of this podcast. Today's conversation will focus on the Ukraine-Russia war, the effect of war through the lives of women and children. Our guest today is Christina Lamb, a British journalist and author. She is Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent for the Sunday Times. Lam won 15 major awards, including four British Press Awards and the European Pre Bayer Calvados for war correspondence. She's an honorary fellow of the University College Oxford and fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and a global fellow for the Wilson Centre for International Affairs in Washington, D.C. In 2013, she was appointed an OBE by the Queen for services to journalism. In November 2018, Lam received an honorary degree of Doctor of Laws from the University of Dundee. She's written nine books, including Our Bodies, Their Battlefield, What War Does to Women. Today, Christina is going to share her recent experiences of being on the Polish-Ukrainian border, the refugee crisis, and observations on what women and children are going through. Welcome, Christina. Thank you. So you've been in uh, Poland recently reporting on the Ukraine-Russia war. Where, in your opinion, is, is the war going? Well, that's a, a million-dollar question, isn't it? I think all of us are still in shock at this whole situation, how I guess nobody ever really believed that Putin would invade Ukraine or, you know, the kind of scenes that we're seeing, the devastation in many of the the towns and cities and uh, and also the huge um, exodus of refugees. Uh, I think it were around three million people, a uh, majority going out through the Polish border where I was. Um, and it seems at the moment we're kind of in a sort of stalemate. I mean, the Russians clearly have made less progress than they hoped. Uh, and there's a lot of questions as to, you know, whether they have overreached. There's stories um, of soldiers just kind of parking their vehicles and walking off into the, the woods. Uh, we know that uh, more than 7,000 Russian soldiers have, have died already, which is more than the US and UK lost in wars in Afghanistan and Iraq altogether, uh, including some top generals. So, and they seem to be having difficulties in, in resupply. On the other hand, you know, they are in a number of places, they are causing a lot of death and destruction. So, uh, what happens next? I suppose we're all hoping that there'll be some kind of peace. Um, deal, but you know it, it's hard to see that. Where at the same time they're, they're still pounding away uh, at all these places. Mm. Any sense of how long you think this this could take, and, and and what the new normal might be? I mean, it's hard to say. Obviously, the Ukrainians have um, been very impressive in their resolve and their fighting, I think, far more than people might have imagined before. Um, And actually, the first thing I ever covered as a foreign correspondent many years ago, back in the late 80s, was the Russian or then Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and occupation. Um, And there were some similarities because, of course, there too, the Afghan people um, rose up against them and they they never managed to um, really take Afghanistan. They were there for nine and a half years fighting, uh, lost 15,000 soldiers, as far as we know, inflicted a lot of damage. About a million Afghans are believed to have been killed in that. Um, but, you know, that shows the difficulty of occupying a place where people just don't want you and where uh, they're willing to uh, risk their own lives to to fight back. So, in fact, a lot of my Afghan friends are saying to me, oh, you've got Afghanistan in Europe now. Mm. Yeah. The, the, the Ukrainians will never surrender. No, but uh, at the same time, you know, how much death and destruction do they 
they want to endure. And it may be that now that the Russians seem not to be achieving what they wanted to do, and we're presuming they thought they would have a quick military victory because they have overwhelming military power, um, and in particular air power, and yet they haven't managed to use that really successfully. Um, presumably, they thought they would be able to topple the government and put a puppet government in place. Well, I think all of us have been absolutely in awe of Vladimir Zelensky and the way that he, his bravery and the way that he's inspired his mm. people. So that really hasn't happened. So, you know, whether, uh, I mean, nobody wants to reward aggression. So I think it would be very hard for the Ukrainians to agree anything which would mean giving up their territory. Um, I mean, the one thing that there seems to be movement on is this idea of Ukrainian neutrality, that they would say that they... uh, don't want to be part of NATO and so Zelensky sort of indicated that they would accept that Uh, but other things the Russians are asking for I mean denazification that's very difficult for Zelensky Mm. he's Jewish himself Mm. Um, and clearly they want to retain um, and, and make part of Russia, Crimea, and the eastern Donbass region. I, it's hard for me to see that the Ukrainians would accept that at the moment. So uh, who knows, really? But, you know, in, in the meantime, lots of people are being killed and losing their homes. And what I saw on the, the border was, you know, just this endless number of, of people fleeing. Mm. And, and your your book, Our Bodies, Their Battlefield, offers a, a voice to to the women of, of, of conflicts. It's a deeply traumatic and, and, and moving book, um, required reading for all. And, and the compassion for those that you talk to and the, the way that you tell their stories really highlights the, the bravery and the grit, you know, amongst many survivors, as well as well as the duty to discuss this, you know, hugely important matter. We're seeing families separated at the moment as men must stay and fight. Can can you share some of the stories you've heard from women and families? Sure. I mean, um, I've covered a lot of refugee crises in the past, 2015, when more than a million refugees came into Europe fleeing war and persecution, mostly in the Middle East, but also in Africa. Um, And then in 2017, the the Rohingya people that fled across the border from Burma into Bangladesh. Um, But what's different about the refugee crisis now? Well, first, it's so fast. I mean, three million people in three weeks. We haven't seen anything like that, but also that it's almost all women and children, because as you said, the men um, aged between 18 and 60 must stay behind to fight. And so it's really quite stark at the railway station in Shemeshul, where people are coming in from Ukraine. Um, there's a sort of building where people are processed as they come off the train. And so you see all the people coming out of that building after they've been processed, which is all, as I said, mostly women and and children and pets, lots of people bringing dogs and cats. I even saw some of the fish. Um, But then going the other way are the the men going back to fight. and, And some of them are saying goodbye to family there and and it's so it's very moving and I met uh, one couple who had actually fled before because they were from the eastern region of uh, Ukraine so they'd already had to flee back in 2014 they'd gone back and now were fleeing again and the husband had brought the wife to the border they had a disabled child so they were he was helping um and then saying goodbye and leaving them there so you know incredibly moving to see that uh, and i met another family where uh, the husband actually was a truck driver. So he had been out of the country when the war started, delivering things in Germany. His wife was a a dentist. And so she 
and uh, their 13 year old daughter fled once the war started they lived near a military base and the the mother who was in her mid 30s she'd driven for four days she told me you know the panic when they left they were woken up by these explosions and they basically grabbed everything their little dog a miniature yorkshire terrier Mm. um and a few clothes they forgot to bring any spare shoes so she was wearing just the trainers that she put on the the daughter was wearing winter boots that she put on um they just left everything and and that woman was very torn because her husband was going back to fight and she wanted to go with him because she said you know i i am a trained medic i could save people's lives but she also didn't want to leave her 13 year old daughter alone in Poland so uh, I think people are having to make really difficult choices Mm, it's it's just horrific um what international humanitarian efforts are are you seeing to help refugees is it enough is it is it getting through and and what in your opinion more needs to be done Yeah, I mean, one of the impressive things actually was the amount of help that's coming, mostly from local people, it has to be said. Now, you know, Poland has not been known for helping refugees or being friendly to refugees in the past. But uh, I mean, honestly, it was humbling to see the help that was being offered to people as they arrived. You know, it was so many people with um, holding up signs, offering lifts, offering places to stay, people being given SIM cards, hot drinks, food, um, nappies for the babies. Um, So enormous amount uh, of help. But it sort of um, was mostly through different local organisations and also people coming from other countries. So there were people, I met people from Denmark who'd gone all the way there to try and offer help and to offer a home. So they were offering lifts back to Denmark and Uh, many from Germany. Um, So there is a lot of help. And, uh, you know, there is a slight feeling too, having covered previous refugee crises where people were refugees, not from Europe, but from Mm. other countries, were not getting quite that same help. So obviously, that's um, a difficult issue. But um, yeah, I think uh, people were getting a lot of help. One issue, though, it the fact that this isn't really coordinated that a lot of this is through facebook groups through um telegram and whatsapp groups it it means that there's a potential for people that want to host refugees for uh, nefarious reasons right so there's Mm. a lot of fear of trafficking because uh, refugees generally are very vulnerable. They're, they're traveling long distances through um, difficult terrain and um, and are very traumatized. And, and so there are reports, unfortunately, uh, of some people who are offering places to, and as I said, it's mostly women and, and children who want them for other reasons. And so that, you know, is something we have to look at very carefully Hmm. we've talked about what's happening on on the ground on the polish ukrainian border how how the invasion is unfolding humanitarian aid and and the consequences to to families especially women and and children next we'll look at what's not being told how some of our member companies can ensure employees and their families are safe and and views on on how this ends. We're going to take a short break and, and be right back with more of my conversation with Christina. Interested in more insights on the current Russian Ukrainian crisis? Visit our geopolitics hub at conferenceboard.org forward slash topics forward slash geopolitics. Here you can find a range of easily accessible insights in the form of webcasts, podcasts, research briefs and more. New resources are being added regularly to help you lead with confidence. Welcome back to the Indications podcast. I'm your host Sarah Murray, Managing Director International of the Conference Board and I'm joined by Christina Lamb. So Christina, what's not being told that we, we need to be aware of? 
Well, as I said, um, you know, refugees are uniquely vulnerable. Um, they're people that have lost everything. They're probably very traumatized. Um, they may have been escaping from bombing and trying to drive different directions to avoid fighting. I mean, it, it's incredibly frightening and shocking because it happened so quickly. I mean, um, most of the wars and conflicts I've ever covered, there's sort of been a more of a build up. It hasn't been like overnight in the way that this suddenly happened. Um, and so, I mean, you could say well, Putin's forces, of course, were gathering for a long time. It's just that I, we all thought he wouldn't really do it. Um, and certainly all the Ukrainians I spoke to felt the same, that they hadn't ever imagined that this really was going to, to happen. So um, one of the issues, and it's something I've looked at a lot is that unfortunately in um, conflicts one of the ways that um, forces try and impose themselves and humiliate their enemy is through uh, raping women and um, so there have been some reports of um, women in Ukraine being raped by Russian soldiers and some videos have been posted by Russian soldiers. It's harder to unique to independently verify that at the moment, but I was contacted today by Dr. McQuaggy, who is this very inspirational doctor in the Democratic Republic of Congo, who um, has a hospital camp Pansy Hospital, which has treated about 55,000 uh, women and girls who have been raped. Uh, so he knows more about this subject, really, than anyone on earth and is a really incredible man. And he contacted me today to say that about how worried he is that this is going to happen, may already be happening in, in Ukraine, um, that we need to be very aware of it because it often doesn't get reported. Hmm. And why are there so few prosecutions for, for war crimes against women? How, how, how can women's voices be heard more? Well, that's a, a good question. I mean, I started really looking at this issue a lot because I was coming across more and more stories of uh, women and girls being raped in war. And in the last seven years, we've had tens of thousands of cases, whether it's the um, Yazidis that were captured by Islamic State fighters and taken as sex slaves and sold over and over again, sometimes as many as 12 times. Uh, then we also had the girls in northern Nigeria, you might remember the Chibok girls who were mm -hmm. taken from their school in the middle of the night by Boko Haram fighters um, and taken into the forest and forced to be their bushwives. Uh, that, that was just the tip of the iceberg. There were tens of thousands of women and girls that that happened to. Um, and then you had the Rohingya, who I mentioned earlier, in 2017, who were forced out of their villages by Burmese soldiers and Buddhist militias. Again, uh, many of those women told how they'd been dragged from their huts and tied to banana trees and gang raped, often in front of their children. So, you know, it was huge numbers of cases in recent years. Um, and yet nobody, not a single person, had been prosecuted for any of those. Um, and it's not that we don't know. The women are coming forward and telling their stories. And it's very difficult for people to, to talk about these kind of issues. So they're very brave to speak about it. But I have to say accountability is very much the exception, not the rule in this issue. And the International Criminal Court in the last 20 years has only successfully convicted one person for uh, sexual violence in conflict, even though in that period there uh, must have been hundreds of thousands of cases around the world. It's just a scandal. Yes, I think so. I, I mean, I just... And, and that's the problem at the moment. There's no cost, really, to the, the perpetrators. They talk about rape in war as being the cheapest weapon known to man, cheaper than a Kalashnikov bullet. 
Um, and sadly, it's also very effective if you want to humiliate your enemy and drive them out, then raping the women and girls is uh, a very effective way of doing it. I was shocked when I started researching this a lot because, I, I mean, for me, the first time I became aware of this was Bosnia in the 1990s when, you know, you had rape camps in Europe and everybody was shocked and talked about this it must never happen again. And there was an international tribunal afterwards. But actually, not many people were prosecuted for the rapes. And uh, when I went to Bosnia to talk to women survivors, you know, they told me, we see our perpetrators in the coffee shop. We see them in working in the local police force. Uh, so actually, one amazing group of women led by one survivor called Bakira had actually set up a group because they became so frustrated to try and track down their, their um, um, perpetrators themselves. And, and they've managed to track down and bring to justice more than 100 people. So that's amazing. But they shouldn't mm. have to do it, right? No. <laughs> um, so I think we're very, very far off any kind of justice on on this. And it's uh, infuriating because it is a war crime and uh, recognised as such by every member of the United Nations. But uh, that they, they haven't actually um, been effective in doing anything about it, in my view. But that's why I think your book is so important, because even though it's it's it shines a light light on some of the darkest parts of a human behavior, it's it's really important to to get that message out that it's happening. And thank um, you. And also, I mean, all the women that I spoke to, I mean, I think one of the problems is that when we have peace deals, this they're almost always, it has to be said, men that sit at the mm. table. There isn't a single peace deal anywhere in the world headed by a woman. Even recently at the Munich Security Conference discussing mm. Ukraine, I think many of us saw that photograph of all, all the men. men at the table. Um, and so for the men, this tends to be something they don't think about or it's a side issue. I've, I've had men saying to me that are involved in peace issues in different places, you know, that, well, why should we look at this? People were being killed and tortured. Well, the fact is, if you talk to any of the women or girls who went through this, that almost all of them said to me they would rather have died than gone through this and that's why it's so important to look at and also it just you know we're in 2022 it's not acceptable that something like this is going on at the moment still in such a scale I mean as we speak you know Ukraine we don't know yet but in detention centers in Belarus um, the brave women protesters that have been uh, locked up a lot of them have been um, suffered sexual violence uh, in the Tigray region of Ethiopia there's a lot of rapes being reported in the detention centers of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang in China uh, also lots of reports um, and uh, the detention centers in Libya where migrants are, are locked up again same thing so um, and then in many different wars around the world that are going on at the moment. So, you know, it's. It, I would say it's fair to say that there is an epidemic of, of, of this, but the action that is needed is just not there. Hmm. Um, many of our, uh, just moving back, back to, to Ukraine, we're hearing from our member companies that, Obviously, in the past couple of weeks, the first priority has been the safety of, of their employees. And that's also meant moving the families of their employees. Um, they've had to relocate wives, children. They've had to set up schooling um, and, and um, provide accommodation. But what, what measures would you say, if there are any others, businesses need to take to, to, to protect these people? Well, all of that, of course, is really good. And the f first priority is, is safety and and also for the children trying to sort of normalise things as much as possible, having them go to school or places to play. Um, but, uh, you know, these people are going to be very traumatised. And so I think, you know, that is a, a big issue. They'll wake up in the middle of the night 
thinking that they're being bombed and um, so they really need help. And also, it's interesting, one of the things that our Yazidi women said to me, I'll never forget, who had been um, rescued and actually taken to Germany uh, to, to be helped in a quite a unique project, which took more than a thousand of the women who'd been kept um, as sex slaves. And they said to me, and I actually stayed, uh, gone to interview a, a group of the women, and then they asked me to stay for dinner. And initially I said no, because I was aware they didn't have much money. <laughs> and also I was staying somewhere really far away. It was a long drive back. But they said, no, no, please, we'd really like you to stay. So I stayed. And then over that dinner, we didn't talk about what had happened to them. We talked about the food. They'd made Yazidi food. So they told me about the traditions. They asked me about English food. I talked to them about fish and chips. <laughs> um, and at the end, they all hugged me. And they said, nobody has a normal conversation with us. All they talk to us about is what all the terrible things that happened to us. And actually... You know, we want to be able to talk about other things, not just our uh, trauma. So I think that's important to remember that people may not necessarily just want to be talk, talk about what they fled from. They might want to just, you know, have a have a coffee and chat about yeah. other things. Um, and they, that always struck me afterwards. Is that actually one way that you cope as well yourself? And when you when you see all of of this horror, sometimes trying to have a normal conversation with these women helps them, but it also, in some ways, it helps you. Yeah, well, I think what helps me also is that, you know, however hard it is to listen to some of these stories, and really some of them are very hard to listen to, and I know are hard to read in my book, but I mm. think that that doesn't mean we should ignore things. I mean, if we ignored anything that was uncomfortable, then things wouldn't change. Um, but the fact is, it's much, much harder for these women and girls to tell their stories and to have gone through what they went through. So I'm endlessly um, in awe of their bravery in, in talking about it. A one girl, a 16 year old said to me, and her story was really hard. And I kept saying to her, are you sure you don't want to stop? And she looked at me quite fiercely and she said, I cannot escape from my trauma. But if it's told, other people cannot say that they didn't know. And that mm. was very important to her. So, yeah. And actually, in a weird way, although much of my reporting is in kind of dark places and places where evil things are happening, it's somehow often in those places that you see people at their best as well. And, mm -hmm. um, and I would say, maybe I'm biased because I'm a female reporter, but it seems to me to be the women often that are holding things together. And I think we forget, we watch on TV, you know, what's happening in these places, the bombing, the people um, fleeing. And, but actually, in the midst of all that, life is still actually going on. You know, people... For example, Syria, where the, the war has been going on for 11 years, there's still millions of people living there, going to work, trying to educate their children, getting married, and um, having babies in the midst of all, all of this. And so that, to me, is real bravery, kind of holding that all together while all hell is breaking loose around you. Um, and as much as many people have fled Ukraine, uh, it's a country of, I think, 44 million people. So there's still, you know, 40 million people mm. still there trying to survive and keep life together and protect their elderly and children. And so that's very inspiring to me. And the women are holding it all together. Yeah. Um, Last question. Any any hope you have for the for the future? I think, you know, although this is awful what's happened, it has sort of woken us up. It, you can't take democracy for granted. You can't take peace for, you know, many of us have all our lifetime have only known peace in our countries. And now we realise actually, um, no, it can be threatened. So we have to be much more aware and the good thing about all of this and I probably wouldn't have predicted this 
uh, particularly having covered Afghanistan, where NATO didn't exactly cover itself in glory and rather abandoned the country in the end. Um, what we have seen as a result of this is is people banding together. I mean, there's been incredible international support um, against what Putin has done and isolating Russia. Uh, and so that is good to see that, you know, that, that there the world can, or much of the world can rally together um, in this situation. Mm. And, you know, things, this is a whole new world order now. We have to really rethink. Lots of people had cut, including the UK, massively cut defence spending, thinking we were in an era of of peace and feeling the biggest threat was China. And, um, and now everybody's having to rethink all of this. Um, mm. Of course, I guess we still hope that somehow um, people in Russia will be able to remove Putin in one way or another and bring this to a halt. And the one big difference, I suppose, from when the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan in the 80s is the, you know, social media, mobile phones. And I I know that the Russian media is, is very controlled. Um, in fact, my son was studying in Russia and had to be evacuated. So I heard firsthand from him about uh, what kind of things were shown on Russian TV. But, you know, uh, you can't, I really don't believe that you can hide um from the truth in the way that maybe they did then. We, uh, many people may have seen the, the brave Russian mother um, mm. speaking the other day about what's happening to her son. And, and, and you know, that as more and more soldiers are killed, there are going to be many mothers that are, and fathers who are um, absolutely devastated and hearing what's happened and may start to question this so let's see yeah indeed christina thank you so much for joining us today and providing listeners with with your perspectives of of, of how war affects women and children i can't i can't thank you enough it's a pleasure thank you for talking to me and thank you to all of you for listening to this podcast every few weeks i'll be joined by experts to provide insights on this issue We'll cover leading topics in public policy, economic impacts, human capital implications, cybersecurity, and supply chains. This has been Insights from the Conference Board.